because somebody else is asking to join. All right. As you heard this story displayed to you graphically and the history of Israel, and we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of messing around with the dollar tree at the same time as saying, oh, we follow God, we follow God. Do you understand where we're at in history today in the time of Ezekiel? Mm -hmm. Why God, I mean, the, I, I couldn't begin to exercise that kind of patience. It, it, it is a testimony to his long suffering that he put up with this for as long as he did. But he did it, as we said, like three or four weeks ago, he did it for his namesake. Remember that teaching when we talked about that? He did it for his namesake because he wants the Gentile nations to get saved. He's made this very public promise to the Jews because he knows they're watching and he did it for his name's sake. He kept these promises in the face of unbelievable stubborn rebellion over centuries. Okay. Sidebar. I just thought this was fascinating. When the Assyrians came in and captured the Northern kingdom, which happened about a hundred years or so prior to when Ezekiel wrote this, you did not want to tick off the Assyrians. The Babylonians would import your best and your brightest. Like they pull Bill out and go, okay, he's an intellect. Let's move him over and we'll up our game in that area of science. And let's pull Dana over because he understands, let's say, military strategy and he can help us with that. And he was an officer. Let's... So they would import your best and your brightest. And even Ezekiel... He lived in a house, guys. He wasn't enslaved in Babylon. He had his own home with it. He was doing these plays on the front porch, if you remember, from chapters one, two, and three, and four. So not bad people to get conquered by. And God had that in mind because he didn't want them to be destroyed. He wanted them to be disciplined to turn back to him. Mission accomplished. It worked. But the Assyrians, hmm, they were some mean people. I found this excerpt, it's not from the Bible, but it's actually from the journal or the annals of one of their kings. So I guess what he would do is after a conquest of a day or two, he would come back and record in his journal how that battle went. And again, this is a name I practiced because it's not an easy one. The Assyrian king that kept this record was Asher Nasirpal II. That's just not like it's bad enough you name your kid that one time. You got to repeat it again. But anyway, Asher Nasirpal II. And he's working his way through the northern kingdom, conquering city by city. And he records for us what he did. This is unbelievable, guys. I felled with the sword 800 of the combat troops of Kinabu. Now you think, well, you know, that's war. That happens. Let's move further. Then I burnt 3,000 captives from them. What? He didn't take them captive. They had, there were no threat to him anymore, and he burned them alive, 3,000 of them, from the city of Kinabu. I did not leave a single one of them alive as a hostage. I captured alive Huleya, the city leader, and in front of him I made a pile of all the corpses. Oh, and I gathered up all the adolescent boys and girls and burnt them alive. Then I took Huleya, the city ruler, and I flayed him alive and draped his skin over the wall of the city of Dam de Musa. I raised, destroyed, and then burnt the city. Then he says, literally, moving on from the city of Kinabu, I approached the city of Tela. The city was well fortified. Hang on, I got to let somebody in. The city was well fortified. I felt 3,000 of their fighting men with the sword, and I carried off prisoners, possession, oxen, and cattle from them. Oh, maybe Ashur Nasipal II is softening. Maybe he's becoming a nicer man because uh, he's taking captive now. Maybe this is a change of heart. 
So he carried them off. I carried many captives away from there, and then I burnt them. The ones I didn't burn, I cut off some of their arms. Some of them I cut off their hands. Others I cut off their noses, ears, and you can only imagine guys and girls on the males. He says there are other extremities. I gouged out the eyes of the troops, of many of them. I made one pile of the living, and then I made another pile of just the heads. And then I took the pile of heads, and I hung the heads on trees, like my interjection, like Christmas tree ornaments, all around the city. Oh, and then I gathered up the adolescent boys and girls, if I forgot to mention that earlier, and I burned them alive too. I raised, destroyed, and burnt and consumed the cities. That's directly, he's talking so matter of fact, no, absolute no sense of humanity, of decency whatsoever. Um, and that was the Assyrians. So guys, when you read this, and, and, and let's go back to the text. When you read this, your thoughts, as you read this, remember I told you to think of the positive attribute of loyalty, the positive attributes of um, fidelity and faithfulness. And I asked you to look for the opposite in our story. Did you not see the opposite riddled all throughout our story of these two sisters? They were the anything but faithful. They displayed anything but fidelity. So, that's your teaching for today is on faithfulness, fidelity, and loyalty. Can you imagine? Now, when I read this to you, weren't you a little like shocked at the language and the detail that God used in his holy word? I was. I was. I mean, he's talking about the size of guys, ding dongs, like donkeys and stuff. It's like, what? This is in the Bible? Keep in mind, guys. Can you imagine the level of hurt and pain that God felt to be able to write this? So graphic. Can you imagine the level of hurt and pain that God felt from his kids that he had done so much for betraying him? Like a husband whose wife runs off and does all this stuff? Can you imagine that level of hurt that God felt to pour out his heart like he did in chapter 23? Let me ask you a question. Have you guys ever trusted someone, maybe a family member, close friend, fellow worker, but you trusted them, you trusted them implicitly and they betrayed you? Now, some of you guys have six, seven, eight decades has that ever happened to you? Do you remember what that betrayal felt like? How that made you feel? Can you begin to appreciate how God feels about betrayal? And conversely, how much he values fidelity and loyalty? Does that make more sense now? Now, the best way... Now I'm going to, let's talk positive here. The best way to interpret what does the Bible mean by fidelity and loyalty is let the Bible interpret itself. So Webster's defines as it is giving a consistent allegiance or support to a person. That's fidelity. The concept of loyalty is all throughout the Bible. As people, this is ingrained in us. Guys, think about this. As people, we long to have friends and family who are on our side no matter what we do. Now, why is that? It's because we were created to be in a relationship with a God who does just that very thing. Our desire that seems innate in us to have these loyal relationships stems from our need to be in a relationship with a God who was so loyal to us, he gave his life for you in the person of Jesus Christ. God is our basis for our understanding of the word loyalty. 
matter of fact, if we could just pull up a little Wikipedia or, or, or Webster's for us oldsters, and, and instead of words being written there next to the definition of the word loyalty, you just see a picture of God. God has to be loyal. It is the, his, one of his key nature, key components. God is loyalty. God pledges his love for all people. Even those, Romans 5 tells us, who are still in rebellion to him, he pledges his love to them. He made a way of salvation available for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you live in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, um, what the color of your skin is, what your hair color is, um, what your language is. He said, all people are precious to me. I want to save everybody who will be saved. He's faithful to keep that covenant and steadfast love. And Deuteron Deuteronomy says, even to a thousand generations. God is loyal to us, guys. Even when we're not loyal to him. His loyalty is so much a part of his very nature. Nothing that you do, Bill, Lee, Ken, can separate you from the love of God. He loves you. He's always with you. He's always for you. So it causes you a rhetorical question to be asked in Romans 8. If God is for you, then who can be against you? That's loyalty. That's faithfulness. That's fidelity. Now, I still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to ramble a little bit further. There's two stories in the Bible, uh, one of Ruth and one of Jonathan that very, very, very beautifully portray this quality of fidelity. Let me talk about Ruth and you're gonna get the Reader's Digest version. I've taught through Ruth at least three times in Breaking Bread, maybe four. It's one of my favorite books of the Old Testament because there's so many allegorical stories in there. There's so many metaphors of Jesus and salvation in that story and God's love. But anyway, the story of Ruth. Here it is, condensed. Reader digest first. Ready, Dana? Another strap your seatbelt on. Here we go. You have this man. He marries a lady. Her name's Naomi. Naomi and, and this guy have two kids, two boys. Oh, there's starvation. There's famine in the land. What are we going to do? We're going to starve to death. We'll go to the land of Moab next door. They've got food. So they go. And everything's good for a while. Oh, unfortunately, Naomi's husband who I've left unnamed in the story because he's written out very quickly, he dies. Now Naomi's a widow. Problem, in the ancient world, widows didn't fare too well. But, ah, ace in the hole. Naomi still has two kids, two sons. The two sons grow up, they get married to women, local women, Moabite women, one of which whose name was Ruth. They're doing along, the sons and the daughter, uh, daughter-in-laws are taking care of mom who's a widow. Whoops, the two sons die. This woman is tragically snake bit in this story. She's lost her husband. She's not in her own country. She's lost both her sons and she has no visible means of support. So she calls in her daughters, daughter-in-laws, calls them in and says, girls, I love you. But I got to go back to the old, old, old country. I got to go back home because I have no way of supporting myself. My husband's dead. My sons are dead. Um, and the famine's over back there. Maybe one of my rich relatives will just have mercy on me and take care of me. But you girls, you, you're still young and pretty. You'll get remarried. Go back to your families. Have babies of your own. Go, go. And with my blessing, go, go, go. And Ruth looks at her and gives one of the most, to me, one of the most famous speeches in the Bible. At, at Naomi's urging, here's what Ruth says back to her. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Here it is. Goosebumps, chills. Still gets me choked up. For where you go, I will go. And where you rest, I will rest your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. One of the greatest speeches of fidelity and loyalty in all the Bible. 
And so Naomi goes, okay, suit yourself. So they both go back to Israel. And Ruth works her butt off, supporting herself and her mother-in-law, who's not even a blood, she's not even a Jew. She's a Moabitess. She's a foreigner in the land, expecting to get um, prejudice applied to her. And God went, I'm going to bless that young lady's socks off. And so he causes a man, a Jewish man, by the name of Boaz, who happens to be rich, never hurts, and he falls in love with Ruth. It's like something out of a Disney movie, except a good, appropriate, cleaned up version. And they fall in love and they live happily ever after. But wait, there's more. Ruth and Boaz have a kid. His name is Jesse. And then Jesse grows up. And Jesse gets married. And Jesse has a kid. Do you know what that kid's name was? David as in King David. Ruth was blessed with being the grandmother of the great King David. And out of David's line came Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Isn't that an awesome story of faithfulness, fidelity, and loyalty? Here's one more. Ooh, I've still got plenty of time. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness. Jonathan. Do you remember when I said before Israel split into two pieces? Uh, they're like clamoring. We want a king. We want a king. Everybody else has got kings. We don't have a king. God, you're shortchanging us. When you don't want a king, we want a king. You don't want a king. We want a king. All right, you're going to get a king. Here you go. So King Saul comes on the scene. And again, he started out okay. And then he starts falling away from God. And the Samuel, the prophet's riding him bad. Like, uh, Saul, you're going to screw up. God's going to take away the throne from you. Fly straight. He doesn't do it. Anyway, backstory, David has slain Goliath, and now he's leading the army. And guess what? The people love David. He's the champion of the people. <laughs> and Saul's like, uh, yeah, I don't really like this guy, David, very much. He feels threatened by him, literally threatened by him, and tries to kill him. So what does Jonathan, Saul's son, do? Well, of course, I'm sure he sided with his dad. Not really. Not really. You see, Jonathan and David were besties from the very first day they laid eyes on each other. I will read to you right out of 1 Samuel. The soul of Jonathan, this is a really cool way of praising this. I love the way this is written. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So even though Saul tried to kill him on numerous occasions, Jonathan protected David. He was respectful to his dad, but he, like uh, one day when, when uh, Saul entered, uh, uh, gave an edict that David was to die, Jonathan helps David escape and get out of there. And and he even pledged uh, like a covenant, a vow to him that he would always fight by David's side against David's enemies. Now, I have a similar situation. Mm -hmm. I'm your third example, but I'm not in the Bible. Decades ago, as a much younger man with a lot more hair, I was working out at a little hole in the wall gym called Melbourne Athletic Club. Some of you guys know this story. And I was, they had the deadlift and squat racks in the back because that's where all the heavy banging was. And I was doing my deads and I have a pretty decent deadlift. And there was a guy up in the front room doing bench. And I noticed him out of the corner of my eye. And he was, he was a stocky guy, but boy, he had a good bench, especially for his size. It's like, wow. Now you can't spot anybody on deadlift, but when you bench press heavy, it's really a good idea to have a spotter. So one day I just went up to this guy, didn't know him. I said, hey, let me know. We're in here apparently at the same time. If you ever need a spot, let me know. And one day he did. And boom, instant knitting of souls together. And Rick has been my best friend now for over two decades. And I count that as a tremendous blessing because there's many people who go through life and never even have a best friend. And I've had one for over two decades. We've gone through highs, lows, ups, downs. 
everything together side by side. And I very strongly uh, suspect that at the end of life, with one, whoever goes out first, the other will be right there by the other side. Guys, that's loyalty. That's fidelity. That's faithfulness. That is beautiful. And as inspiring as those stories from the Bible are, whether mine are inspiring or not, I don't know. But certainly Ruth's is and Jonathan's is. We got to be inspired by another one. How about someone who loved you so much that he died so that you could have an abundant life? That someone, Jesus, asks one thing. He asks for your ultimate loyalty, your ultimate fidelity. Above your spouse, moms, above your kids, above your own parents, above your own friends, and yes, even above your own country and your own life. Now, loyalty to people is good. But loyalty to God is even better. It doesn't usurp the others, by the way. It's an order. God says to love him first, then to love others. Not to love him first and then hate everybody else. He says, love me first and, then everything, and love others, and then everything else will fall in its proper place. So what's my point? And what's your takeaway with 60 seconds left to go? Gosh, I couldn't have timed this better. Thank you, Lord. Every time you guys read the Bible and learn more about God, you're being loyal. Every time you pray for yourself, like we talked about last week, or for others in intercession, you're showing loyalty. Every time you participate in this breaking bread class or watch it later online, you're showing loyalty. Every time you go to church on the weekend, whether it's Saturday night, Sunday morning, whenever, whenever, you're showing loyalty. Every time we give of our time or our money to God's work, you are showing loyalty. My point, you guys are exhibiting this quality that God loves. Look at the opposite and look at his breaking heart when he wrote chapter 23. Mm. Let's continue, guys. I'm not trying to talk about religious duties or checklists or anything else, but loyalty and fidelity and faithfulness are displayed in a thousand different ways every day of your life, but you guys are doing a great job in a world where the culture is attacking you, where the world, where everything seems to be falling apart from a moral standpoint, you guys are faithful. You're displaying the fidelity and loyalty that God values so much. So just keep on keeping on. All right. That's your message. That's your encouragement. Take yourselves off mute. See if you got any questions about what we went over, anything that I glossed over in the high-level summary. I'm shutting up and letting you guys talk. As always, Lynn, it's great. You put a lot of effort, and I can tell on this, and we all appreciate it, I'm sure. Thanks, Dana. Thank you very much, Lynn. I studied for five minutes before I got online. That's all. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. Lee, Lee already called me out, said, I'm, I just wing these things every week anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, this was great. I was thinking one of the verses in chapter 23 is exactly what I did early in my life. I did great while I was, until I got out of high school. And when I went to college, uh, there were too many temptations for what I was prepared for. But I had to, I was reminded today, I did exactly what it said they did. I put the Lord 
behind me. That's uh, the best way I can describe it. Yeah. And then the, yeah. Instead of facing him, instead of being with him every day, I put him back here behind me. And it said they, they put the Lord back. And um, that is the perfect way to put it. It's, it's so easy to do that and think, oh, he's, he's not going to notice what I'm doing here. And you step forward and do something. So uh, that was a grim reminder for me. And it makes me want to, uh, to do the way I'm supposed to do. It was great. Thank you for your, your words today. And Lee, I'm glad you said that because none of us is perfect. And none of us are always going to be 100% faithful or 100% loyalty or show fidelity 100% of the time. Look how bungled up the Israelites were for hundreds mm -hmm. of years. And God was still patient with them. It's, it, it's mind boggling, actually. But it is. it's also encouraging to me not to give up. Mm -hmm. The next time, unfortunately, it's not if, it's a when. The next time when I screw up and I'm unfaithful to God, I could just quit because that's what the enemy does this and whispers in my ear and says, you just, you're such a loser. You do this all the time. You're going to do it again tomorrow if you get the chance. You just quit being a hypocrite and you just need to give up. That's what he does. And I need to go back to 23 and go, okay, since their time in Egypt, they messed around mingling idolatry with the worship of God. They did it for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And God at any point, well, up to Ezekiel chapter eight, up to any point would have forgiven them. <laughs> Eight's when he dropped the hammer, by the way, Bill. And he says, ah, no more, it's judgment's coming. But even <laughs> then it wasn't, I'm not gonna wipe you out. Right. I'm gonna preserve a remnant like he did with the, when, when, before they went into the promised land and they refused to go, I'm going to preserve the work because I made a covenant. Well, he makes a covenant to us through Jesus Christ, our savior, right? Hey, we can, he knows we're going to screw up, but it's okay. Not okay. Don't get me wrong. It's not a good, it's not good to screw up, but don't give up Exactly. when you screw up. <clears throat> And it's so good to know that God doesn't give up on us either when we screw up. Oh, yes, most definitely. The incredible patience that he shows over and over and over again. Uh, what a good God. Mm -hmm. What a faithful yes. God. Amen. Yeah, I don't ever want him describing me in the context of chapter 23. That's not a really flattering no. way of viewing somebody. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess what, what got me teary-eyed when I read this was I just, you know, I've gone through some dark stuff myself with betrayal and I vividly could feel God's heart just being absolutely broken, mm -hmm. broken over what he had experienced with th this, these people that he had done so much for. And how they had so thoroughly abused that trust. So I just felt his heart and uh, really made me understand what God felt. So, Ned, it's good to see you, buddy. If you can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you can hear me, can you tell me how you're feeling, how you're doing? Yeah, okay. I was at the, uh, I guess I was at the... Uh... got started and I tried to come in with my cell phone and I finally got the voice but and I might have got the picture but then I finally got home and now I'm doing but how do I feel I feel great in fact she talked awesome. today to Good. talk today about taking me off oxygen so awesome that's great yes yeah, so we'll see why that goes in the other way. all right all right. Well, Dana says he sees you drag racing up and down the street all the time so that's a good sign <laughs> yeah he ran over me the other day <laughs> <laughs> well guys i want to thank you for for joining us uh i know i didn't do an opening prayer i boo-booed uh can't remember everything every week sorry uh actually i'm going to pick on bill if you don't mind bill would you close us out in prayer this week but before you do we got 16 folks on here 
Goodbye, Whoa. Paul. Goodbye, Ron. Goodbye, Jim. Goodbye, Ned. Goodbye, Donna. Good seeing you, Donna. Say hello to Mark. Bye, Ned. Bye, Dan. Bye, Steve in your car, rolling mobile somewhere. Goodbye, Lee. Goodbye, Ken. I look forward to getting my present. Goodbye, Kay. <laughs> nice to see you. It really is nice to literally see you. Uh, goodbye, John. Goodbye, Dana. Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Marty. And now, Bill, close us out in prayer. Goodbye, Lynn. <laughs> goodbye, Lynn. Goodbye, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you for this wonderful gathering that you allow us to have, to listen to your word and the insight that you have given Lynn to teach us about the infidelities of those who love you so much and the patience you show to them, that we may learn from that, that we know that you are forever, ever, ever faithful to us, although we may be unfaithful to you, and your grace is forever. And that knowledge is the treasure that's beyond compare. And through your word, we know how much you love your people for thousands of years, that what's one lifetime that we have, what's one lifetime, yet we see through your word and through our experiences, the love and faithfulness you have, even when we are not faithful to you. Uh, Lord, uh, we've been blessed. We've been blessed in this gathering. We've been blessed that we can listen to your word. We've been blessed by this group. And we thank you so much for such a blessing in spite of our unfaithfulness, in spite of our yeah. frailties, our failures. But we love you and we trust mm -hmm. you and we know you're faithful to us. Yes. And because of that, we thank you, Lord. And we thank you. Amen. 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 Well said, Amen. Amen. All right. Hey Ned, I will send you. I will send you the videos this week since you. I think you missed part of uh, yes. two and all of one. So yes. I'll send those out to you. Thank you guys very much for joining me this week. As Thank always, you. it would be really a bummer if I flipped this thing on at eleven fifty-eight and there were no faces on here. Oh, I would be. <laughs> I would be mildly irritated at that. So what yeah. happened? Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right, we'll see you guys next week. See you guys right. next week, and I'll have new baby pictures. All right. <laughs> Somebody needs to remember to ask me to show them, because I got this cutest video. My daughter walking in the room, and her little face just lights up, and she starts Aww. laughing and giggling when she sees my daughter. It's like, oh, that's great. Can't wait to go see her. All right. Oh, yeah. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Right. Right. Thanks so much. We love you, man. Yep. Yes. Amen.